Ah, I told you we were going back to the 1950s. Um, hello and welcome to my video on the Alvaro Arrow. Uh, as I've already covered my favorite plane, the Panavia Tornado, uh, it's about time that I cover the plane that helped kickstart my journey into becoming a complete and utter aerospace nerd. <laughs> so let's get into it. Canada in the 1950s was at the top of its game when it came to aircraft manufacturing and development. They had produced the CF-100 Canuck and produced under license the F-86 Sabre, which was produced as the Canada Air Sabre. As well as during the Second World War, Canada produced over 22,000 Spitfires and other numerous aircraft. Uh, so I'd say Canada's aviation industry was booming. In the 1950s, at the Avro Canada Company, a subsidiary of the British Avro Company, who created the Avro Lancaster and Avro Vulcan, was experimenting with a swept wing of their CF-100 all-weather fighter. This project was called the CF-103. At the same time, the Canadian government was looking for an all-weather interceptor to use in northern Canada. For those who don't know what an interceptor is, it is essentially a fighter that is purposely built to intercept bombers and other aircraft that violates its country's respective airspace. So, in 1953, the Royal Canadian Air Force, or RCAF, asked Avro Canada to build and develop an all-weather interceptor capable of reaching 50,000 feet, going as fast as Mach 1.5 and having a range of 600 nautical miles and be able to maneuver at 2 Gs under the 7-3 design studies of a prototype supersonic all-weather aircraft. The Canadian government really needs to get better at those specification names. Um, after all these specifications were given to Avro, they immediately started modifying their CF-103 blueprints until it came up to spec with the RCAF's requirements. The only way it can maneuver at 2 Gs at its immense speed at Mach 1.5 uh, was to adopt Delta Wings, and that's exactly what Avro did. The design ended up having a 15 meter or 49 feet wingspan. Also, to achieve the speeds, the Avro company worked with its old partner, Arenda Engines, who had developed and built the engines for the Canuck. Avro ended up creating the Iroquois engine. The Iroquois engines were after burning turbofan engines and were capable of 25,000 pounds of thrust. Also during the development, Avro started to create a fly-by-wire system. Although fly-by-wire had already been invented, it had not been put, been put into a production aircraft. The Avro would be the first aircraft to do that. This is where I have to stray away from aerospace history into and jump into some Canadian history. Uh, in 1957, midway through the project, the Avro Aero project, the Conservative government of John Deven Baker was elected in Canada. The Conservative government was not very keen on the cost of the Aero program, which at the time was $1.1 billion in 1950s money, which is a lot more in today's money. I was, and this would have random ramifications later on for the era. It's best we get back to some aerospace history now. One thing about the development of the era is that all the aerodynamic testing that went into the program. Luckily, I've been able to see some of the artifacts from these tests in museums, and you can too at the Canadian Air Aviation Space Museum. Uh, anyway, some of these tests include using rockets to propel scale scaled down models of the Aero into Lake Ontario. The information gained from these tests were invaluable to the Aero program as it allowed the development team to figure out the optimal type of wing for the Aero. On October 4th, 1957, the first Aero RL-201 rolled out of Avro's manufacturing plant in the Mississauga suburb of Malton, but the Aero did not receive the reception from the press that was expected, as on the same day Sputnik, the first man-made satellite, entered orbit. This is where I get the most frustrated with the story. as with the launch of Sputnik, people started to think that the Soviets would no longer use intercontinental bombers, which the Aero was supposed to counter as missiles could now reach areas of, of the world. Later, on March 28th, after multiple taxi tests, the Avro Aero took its first flight with Battle of Britain veteran Jan Zerkowski at the controls. The Aero flew exceedingly well and was truly an engineering masterpiece. Later in the year, the Aero had its first incident in June of 1958. When the port undercarriage, otherwise known as the landing gear, malfun malfunctioned, not locking properly into place, veering the aircraft left, or port as it is mentioned in the report, skidding Aero 201 off the runway and ripping its gears off the aircraft. Later on November 11, 1958, Aero 202 had the Aero's second crash after three of the four la rear landing gear tires burst once again, throwing the Aero off the runway. The landing gear mechanism and the landing gears in general was a major issue during the Aero's development, but that should not take away from the strides the Aero made in aerospace technology. One of them is reaching close to Mach 2, 
On the same flight as Aero 202's landing malfunction, secondary test pilot Spud Patecki pushed the Aero to Mach 1.98, almost Mach 2. This ended up becoming the fastest speed recorded in the entire program. The Aero continued test flights until February 20th, 1959, where the Diefenbaker government cancelled the Aero program. This day is known as Black Friday. It's an extremely contentious issue as to why the Aero was cancelled. Some people point the finger at the United States, pressuring Canada into cancelling the Aero. Some say it was the Diefen was Diefenbaker's dislike for Avro Canada's president, Crawford Gordon Jr., but many historians believe that the price of the Aero and its perception that it would be obsolete is to blame for the cancellation of the Aero. I believe with this, as on the same day the Aero was rolled out, Sputnik launched, which created the ICBM scare, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, uh, and the perception that long-range bombers were no longer needed. This idea of interceptors and long-range bombers being obsolete has been proved wrong again and again, with the Soviet Union and even today Russia flying Tu-95 bears over northern Canada. After the cancellation was announced, all arrows and arrows in production, including plans and other documents, were destroyed out of fear that Soviet intelligence would use the, the information gained from the aero program to create their own aircraft. Luckily, some of the parts of the aero have been saved. The wingtips and front cockpit and nose section, along with an Aranda Iroquois engine, have been saved and restored at the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa. A second Iroquois engine has also been preserved at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton, Ontario. Also, I think it's something like two or three replicas have been built, uh, and they're all over Ontario and Alberta uh, here in Canada. The cancellation of the Aero took away one of Canada's most impressive feats of engineering, and now most of it has been lost to history. But before we end, uh, if you're en if you're interested in reading more about the Aero, I suggest picking up the book Aver Aero by the Arrowheads. I'm pretty sure if you live in Canada, uh, like I do, you can still buy it at like a, an Indigo. Uh, anyway, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Please consider liking and subscribing. Goodbye.